great to be in God's house tonight, and thank you for coming out. I realize that every time you come out to the house of the Lord, it's an investment, and you know, those that invest their time wisely, or God, good stewards of what God has given to you, your time, your talent, your treasure, God will reward you for that. Um, you know, what, what you feed grows. And you feed good things, good things grow. You feed bad things, then, you know, you're fighting weeds and all the stuff we have to fight with all the time. So I, I just want to encourage you tonight that, you know, the fact that you're here or you're watching online um, is a good thing. Positioning yourself to receive from what the Lord is saying. And tonight is a very practical session. Uh, it's not a Bible study as such, although we don't know anything else other than the Bible. Uh, and so, so whether we say it's from a scripture or whether we say it, you know, I, I don't like to give opinion other than what the Bible tells us is true. You know, what God says is much better than what I say. I've tried saying what I say and it doesn't go down very well. So I decided to just stick with God, okay? Because his plans and his purposes succeed. Um, for the, I think most of you were here on the weekend, but I realized that, that you know, there may be people watching online or watching this video later uh, that don't know who we are. We're Mark and Julie Morse, originally from Wales in the United Kingdom. And we've been ministering, uh, traveling and ministering for 19 years. And in that time, we've been in 34 nations and lived on three continents. And I say that to, to, to let you know that, that you know, as you travel, you realize not everybody thinks like you think. Every culture that we've been to has their battles, but they also have their jewels as well. You can learn from people in other cultures. I remember when we first came to the States, um, you know, we loved the generosity of the States. We, we loved the enthusiasm, the mainly. It was, it was a lot more enthusiastic the first time we came. Uh, these days, I don't know, it's getting there to join the British culture. Um, but we loved that. And, and you know, but after, having been here for six months, I remember that whenever you're in any culture after six months, you start to see maybe the things that aren't so good. And I remember thinking, what is there about our culture back home that we were overlooking because we were so familiar with it? And I started to think, what were the pitfalls in our culture and what were the jewels in our culture? And so it set me on a journey just to look at what type of things um, were, I should be focusing on. You know, and I, I, I always laugh when you have an American pastor overseas leading a church, and he says, we're not American, we're kingdom. And you can guarantee that most of their culture is American because they were raised in America, and their version of kingdom has got an American flavor to it. We served a, an American pastor in Zimbabwe for a year, and, and he always used to say, you know, we're kingdom culture. And I understood that, but some of the things he said only, only really applied in America. And he was adjusting to this African understanding of how the kingdom works in a culture where they have no frame of reference to things that are comfort to us in the West. And so it's, it's a pleasure to be in Minnesota. And uh, we, we've had a great time with Kurt and Julie. Yesterday, we went through a Steps to Freedom process. So if you've never seen your pastors as free as they are now, <laughs> amen. <laughs> So they were doing cartwheels and somersaults earlier, you know. <laughs> and it's just, it's just been good to, to hang out and get to know each other better. And, you know, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. You know, you, you sort of become who you hang out with. It's good to hang out with good people, especially people who have a heart after God. So I just want to encourage you today. Our ministry is Kingdom Purpose International, and our, our ministry vision is to see every believer walk unhindered as ambassadors for Christ to thrive in their Kingdom Purpose. What does that mean? Well, that simply means that we all have a, a purpose that God has ordained for each and every one of us. But we don't always thrive in that purpose because, you know, when we come to Christ, often things from our past can be dragged over the line with us. It's almost like we've got suitcases uh, and luggage, you know, wandering around with us. And every time we want to do something, there's this weight that holds us back. Uh, and we feel that there, there are ways that we can 
to ditch that luggage so that we are freer. That's what we did yesterday. Uh, we went through this freedom in Christ process to just try and, you know, people hold on to unforgiveness. People hold on to to circumstances and trauma that, that happened to them. And we never want to decry what happened. You know, we don't want to say it didn't happen. But, you know, today is today. And don't allow what happened in the past to derail you from the future that God wants to have. And our passion is really to see you running for God and not limping. Because God has a plan and a purpose. He's, you know, he's on mission to save the world and we are part of his relay team. The baton is in our hands. And he's saying, run, guys, run. And so that's what we just want to encourage you with tonight. Uh, over the next few weeks, we're meeting with several groups of Christian business leaders in Warsaw and Madison. I had to spell Warsaw, W-A-R-S-A-W, because I can't say Warsaw, I, I keep saying it. Warsaw, <laughs> you know. Why do I tell you these inside jokes? I don't know. I just want you to know that we are just human beings just like you, okay? God uses... No, I won't say that. That's my insecurity saying that. I was, I was going to say God uses the base things of this world to confound the wise and the mighty, but that's really insecurity. So I'm not saying that to you tonight, okay? I'll just unpack, I'll just unpack this to tell you that we are all on a journey, we're all on a journey, and none of us are perfect. We used to say when we were pastoring, if you're looking for a perfect church, don't come here. You'll spoil it. Uh, and, and we are not perfect. We're just uh, people on a journey that's going from strength to strength, from glory to glory. You know, uh, what, the, what we're doing in a, in a few weeks' time is we're speaking to business leaders about a subject of a light, uh, discovering their kingdom purpose, but... Alignment for your kingdom assignment is the subject that they want us to talk about to them. They understand this group of people that they have a kingdom assignment as business leaders. And they want to advance the kingdom in the domain of the business world. So many people think that the only way to advance the kingdom is by coming to church. And if the church doesn't do it in this building, it's not going to be done. You know, this place is a place of celebration about what God is doing. It's a place of consecration. It's a place where we come corporately and we worship God. But, but Sunday and Tuesday and any other time you come here is the church gathered. But Monday to, to Saturday is the church scattered. And so we have to understand that we are still the church. When we pastored, we would go and do church on the beach. We said the church is going, leaving the building and it's important for us to understand that when we go into our sphere of influence, we are the church in that sphere of influence. The church is not a building. It's not bricks and mortar. And I realize in our cultures today, we, we mainly understand church. If we say, oh, we're going to church tonight. Well, you are the church. You're taking the church to church tonight. Uh, and that's just the way we, and, and we, we have to retrain ourselves to understand that when you go to the workplace tomorrow, the church has arrived in the workplace because the kingdom of God is within you. And you're taking the kingdom in with you. And God has a divine assignment and a divine purpose for you being there. Now, you may say, well, I've been there 20 years and I haven't seen it yet. Well, that's okay. You know, there's no condemnation for what you've done in the past. But today I'm telling you that you have a responsibility to ask God, how can you use my life to be effective in my sphere of influence. I'm sure Pastor Kurt would love to go to all your workplaces and talk to all your work colleagues or, or, or go home with you and talk to your kids as you're homeschooling them, but he doesn't have that opportunity. But as he mobilizes you, you have that opportunity to go into that sphere of influence and share what God is saying. I, I don't mean that you, know, you stand up on the table in, in the grocery store and you shout, thus saith the Lord. You know, people think you're crazy. 
maybe that's what some people think they should do. But for me, you know, it's just a case of saying some, simply, we're at breakfast this morning and, and the guy in a hotel, you know, he's sort of casually talking to us. And we realize that we represent the kingdom of God in that breakfast room this morning. And, you know, he, he casually asked about our accents. It was always an easy in for us to talk to somebody. And he said, what are you doing here? And we start to say, well, you know, we've been traveling and ministering. And we're at Stonebridge Church. It's a great church here in Burnsville. We'd highly recommend it. And, you know, we were a representation of this church. But we're a representation of the kingdom of God. There are divine opportunities each and every day that we need to start to notice you know, God is patient and gracious with us because we go into situations and we fail to tell people or to take the opportunities in front of us. But God is gracious. He gives you chance after chance after chance. He's the God of the second, third, 30,000th chance. So don't condemn yourself thinking, well, I've never done that. God could never use me. You know, it's those sort of statements that really condemn us. And that is agreeing with the enemy's plan for your life. But if you start to agree with God's plan, things will change. Alignment for your assignment, really alignment. You know, if, if you've got a vehicle, you can go and get your, your car aligned. Uh, and if it's out of alignment, it just means that, you know, the front wheels and the back wheels are pointing slightly in different directions. It wears your tires quicker and sometimes you may feel a juddering on the wheel or you may feel it pulls out of the lane. And it's important that your car is in alignment. I think I said on Sunday that we went to a chiropractor's office who was, he wanted us to go and pray a blessing over his new business. And uh, he wanted to explain to the, the group that we had there uh, what his plan was. And he said, has any, uh, anybody not been to a... a chiropractor's office before and I think he was thinking you know this is a stupid question because everybody's been to a chiropractor and Julie and I said well we've not been to a chiropractor I don't know if he believed us he's like what are you you're that poor that you can't afford a chiropractor I, I said we've never needed a chiropractor and I said no we've never been to one but I said to him you know we're going to preach about alignment for your assignment and it seems that your assignment is alignment uh, but but in, in that, I said, I, you know, I want you to see this business as not just aligning people's bodies and their spines, but aligning their spiritual life with what God, you know, you're coming to have a, a relationship with people who are grateful that you fix their bodies in some way, but there's a spiritual aspect of your life where you can release an anointing of the Holy Spirit and, and ask God for divine appointments along the way. But before we look at uh, discovering your kingdom purpose, I feel it would be helpful to give you a picture of what we feel from our experience are important aspects of alignment. Now, I, I, I find it difficult to stick to a subject whenever I'm teaching something because I, I sense what's happening in the room and I sense what people are thinking. And I tend to think that, okay, I don't think they're quite ready for this next statement. So let's go back a, a, a few lines and, and just fill in what I mean by this alignment for your assignment. I like to be super practical if I can. And I'm a real uh, list guy. Anybody here like lists? Anybody have a, you know, my notes in my phone, uh, I have got a bunch of lists. I've got, I think, tw 2,600 lists <laughs> on my phone. People say, how do you remember so much? Well, Apple helps me. It, it helps my brain. And, um, you know, I shared it with Julie. Um, so we share notes. And she's like, ah, oh, 2,600 notes. She's not a list person. I said, just don't mess up my lists, please. <laughs> There's grace, but please don't mess up my lists. Um, so I just created this graphic. It's just a clipboard with, with, with a list, four, four things on a list. I want to make this simple tonight. Um, number one on this checklist is to know God. Now, this may be, as we're gathering as a church tonight, an obvious one that we need to know God. But, you know, you can never assume that everybody that comes to a church building knows God. You can never assume that everybody who says they're a Christian knows God. Very often they'll know about God, they'll know something of God, they'll believe there's a God, but they don't know him. They don't understand his character. 
They don't understand the relationship that is available. You know, sometimes we talk to people and we say, do you have an intimate relationship with God? And they're like, what do you mean? We didn't even know there's such a thing. We've never heard our minister say that. We've just come to church. We've sung songs. We've pre- he's preached a message and we've gone home. I say, you know, God wants to talk to you. God wants to be intimately involved in your life. So to know God, I'm not going to expand on these tonight, but I just wanted to touch before we get on to the third point. Um, And it's important that we understand who God is. When we understand his character, we learn to trust him much more. You know, sometimes I've, in the past, I've had fear in my life because I thought something was going to happen until I learned who God was. And I learned, I I got the understanding that, you know, he is faithful. If he says it, he's going to do it. And no matter how much worry I have in my life, that's not going to change his faithfulness or his ability that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And yet if I think this thing is going to work out bad, what am I saying? I'm saying I don't trust God more than I trust my opinion. And I've had to learn over the years that God is faithful. And the more trust I put in him, the more trustworthy he is. And so knowing God is so, so important. This is why discipleship is so important. I love the series that you've been doing uh, with your identity in Christ, that you understand not only who God is, but you understand who you are as a result of being a Christian. That moment you step over the line, you're in Christ. All of a sudden, the enemy can't get to you unless he goes through Jesus. And we all know he's, t- he's taken him on once and he lost. Such, such, he lost big time and he doesn't want to do that again. But if he can entice you out of that mindset of being in Christ, then you're fair game uh, and you could be attacked. Secondly, the second thing is to find freedom. This one is so, so, so important. I couldn't emphasize finding freedom enough to you. So if this is your checklist of how are you doing, I'm sure most of you would say, I know God. I'm on a journey to understand God. I'm on a journey to understand who I am in Christ, my spiritual identity. Uh, But often people will skip over this find freedom. They just think their lot in life is to have some thorn in the flesh. They may even spiritualize it and say, well, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Why shouldn't I? Well, you can have whatever you want to have. But the Bible says that Jesus has died and rose again. He's taken on all our sicknesses, all our diseases, everything that could harm us, he has dealt with if we will stay in our position in Christ. So to find freedom is simply to get, and I say simply, I realize it's not that easy, but, but in its basic form, finding freedom is coming to a place where we renounce those things that has gone on in our past. That's part of the process that we went through yesterday uh, with Pastor Kurt and, and Julie, and we took them through their life and the things that's happened to them and anything that maybe they are believing, which isn't actually the truth. Now, none of us think that we're deceived. None of us think that we don't believe the truth. We all think that what we believe is true. We're fearful because we think that the the object of our fear is real. Uh, Every time I pray for somebody over fear, I always say to them, I use the acronym F-E-A-R, fear, false evidence appearing real. It's false evidence. It's not real. I know it's real to you, and I know it's a real thing to you. And if you can get caught in this cycle of fearing something that's not real, you know, the devil will take ground from you in your life. So finding freedom is so, so important. The third thing on a checklist, which we're really going to talk about tonight, is discovering our kingdom purpose. Some of you are walking partly in your kingdom purpose. Some of you think it's just your natural gifting. It's just, but you know, God gave us all our character, our nature. He he gave us our gifting, our abilities. We were born, the Bible says that he knitted us together in our mother's womb. You know, he doesn't make mistakes. The things that you would prefer didn't happen to you or weren't part of your life, God took that into consideration when he made you. 
And sometimes we go through some traumatic situations and they shape us in a certain way. And I, I don't understand fully why we go through some of the things we go through. But what I know is God uses everything, the good and the bad, for our good eventually, if we can trust him. I'll just, touch, I'll just give you the fourth thing, but we're not really going to uh, talk about that tonight. The fourth thing on the list is to make a difference. You know, when Julie and I were in business 20 years ago, and we were doing really, really well at what we were doing, and I felt I was making a difference in so many ways, but I really thought there must be more in life than we were seeing. And when I say must, must be more in life, I was really talking from a spiritual aspect because I believed that God had made me for a kingdom purpose, a kingdom reason. And I didn't feel that I was invested in the majority of my day or my resources in thriving in what God had called me to do. I was caught up with a busyness. Anybody know what busyness is? Anybody know how busy uh, you have to do this, you have to do that, and there's, there's never enough hours in the day. You go to bed exhausted, and then all of a sudden the alarm goes. You're like, oh, no. I thought I dreamt that, but it's real. I've got to get up, and I've got to start the day again, and we go into this cycle of exhaustion as people. You know, we, we need to operate out of a place of rest, it's no good just running and running and running. I mean, if you are operating out of a place of exhaustion, firstly, you're dishonoring your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Judy and I are working on this. Let me tell you, you know, we are exhausted most of the time because we never know. We don't have an off button. I, I know we talked to Pastor Kurt about that. We don't have an off button. Um, so we have to purpose ourselves to rest purpose ourselves to take time alone with him so that we're not giving out of an empty tank, but we're fueling people out of a full tank. Uh, and that, that's his call on our life. But we all want to make a difference. We want to see the world changed as a result. We want to add value. That Julie and I, that's really what we want to do with everybody we meet. Our heart is, how can we add value to this person, whether it's somebody in a church or a hotel or a gas station or a grocery store, how can we add value to the person in front of us? The author Mark Twain once said this quote, he said, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Somebody once said that, that dying is not the worst thing, but dying without living is the worst thing, without really living and, and fulfilling the purpose that you were meant to fulfill on this earth. I, I like to change that to, from Mark Twain to Mark Morse, uh, and I just added a line on there, and I said, the three most important days in your life are the day you were born, the day you were born again, and the day you find out why. You are saved for a reason. It, it, it wasn't a coincidence. God wasn't desperate, so he thought he'd save you. He wasn't looking for a crowd of people, but he was looking for a family. And he decided that you were somebody that he was going to woo into relationship with him. You know, people these days will attend church fairly regularly and maybe hear some great teaching, and, and they'll just miss the point that they have a part to play in the kingdom of God. They think their part is to be faithful to come into a building. And that's great. If, you know, I, I know I'm preaching to the, the choir tonight, as they say, you know, you're already in the building. Um, but so many Christians, you know, they, they think this is all it is. That there is more opportunity to be the, the people of God in our workplaces, in, in our social circles. On Facebook, I said this to you Sunday, I love interrupting the flow in Facebook and bringing the kingdom and kingdom perspective. Somebody, one of our good friends from, uh, from I was in Bible school with him, he, he, he posted this morning this conspiracy theory. Uh, that's all I could say about something about diesel and how Russia controls it and China controls it, put it on Facebook. And for me, I was like, oh, my goodness. How, you know, why would he, who cares about this stuff, you know? And I, and I posted the scripture, you know, 
consider the lilies of the fields, how they toil not, you know. God, God's got a plan in all this stuff. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough worry about it. So I wasn't sarcastic. I just said, I'm thankful that Jesus said, and I posted the scripture on there. One of our other friends who was in Bible school at the same time put on there to him, uh, how can I make this shareable? And I, I was going to be sarcastic. And I said, share this. Share this. This is the type of thing that you want to promote. Not the fear and, and the limited mindset. What if another nation comes? We, you know, we are part of the kingdom of God. God is not fearful about the gas prices at the moment. God is not fearful about the end of the world. He knows the end from the beginning. So don't waste your time. I know I probably get complaints about this. Don't waste your time on things you can't control. Just start to invest in what God is doing. Because why? Because they're eternal. One day, those gas pumps will go up in smoke. One day, that car will rot. One day, that house that you've worked all your life for will be left behind. But in eternity, will be with Jesus. And I look forward to that day. You know, when Judy and I were in business, we were doing well. Everybody looking on to us thought we were successful. People wanted to be us. We were those people that we had enough money, we had enough prestige, we had a nice house and nice vehicles, we went on nice vacations. Things were going well for us, but there was an internal dissatisfaction that said, God, there must be more than this. Now, somebody looking on says, what more could you want than all the things that we think we want? And I said, well, when you've achieved them, you realize they're not all you thought they would be. And so, you know, I put this, this note down that, you know, a great first indicator that change is coming in your life is often a deep internal dissatisfaction. God has put an indicator within you that when you start thinking, you know, there's something different about what I'm doing, we, we, we've, we like to call it the grace lifting. There's a grace for every season that you're in. But when the grace lifts, you feel, Lord, what's happening here? You have to ask the Lord, Lord, is it time to move on? Or is it time to resist this? Is this a battle from the enemy? Or is the grace just lifting so that I can consider whether I make a change in my life? And I really hope that, that more than anything else from this time with you these three days, that God plants in your heart a desire to seek him for what his plan and his purpose is from today on. That you will be activated. I, I want to come back here in a, however many months or years time and, and you tell me testimonies of, you know, that next week we went into work and we just said to somebody who was struggling, could I pray for you? And the depression lifted. Disease went away. You know, illness just dropped off them. And they come into our church now. You know, they're born again. They were going to hell, but now they're going to heaven. That's what I want to hear. That's a win for us in our lives, and I want to hear that. The first two things I want to establish tonight is, number one, God can and will use anyone who is willing. I deal with so many people who are insecure, and it doesn't matter where you are in life, insecurity is a problem at every level, whether you're a leader or whether you don't feel you have anything going for you, insecurity is often, but God can and will use anyone. Every believer has a kingdom purpose. You didn't miss the roll call. God didn't say every believer has it, but you don't have one. You just have to exist and go through the motions. So you are included. Let me just tell you a quick testimony of, of a young man that we met in Jacksonville, Florida. Julie and I attended Christ for the Nations Bible School in 2003 and 2004. And we've had a great relationship with that Bible school in Dallas for the last 19 years. And we've hosted 12 international mission teams all over the world with Christ for the Nations. I love to train the next generation. You know, I realize that, you know, I may die before Jesus comes back. I hope he comes back soon, but there may be a time that he comes and I'm gone on to be with the Lord anyway. Uh, and so we need to raise up the next generation of people who will take the gospel to our neighbors and the nations. And so uh, we had a team come 
to Jacksonville, Florida, a team of 25 students. Um, that over three different years, we had three different teams, and we would take them in to City Rescue Mission in Jacksonville, Florida. And when we go there, you have, you have a homeless feed-in center, and then you have a drug rehabilitation center for those who have come off the streets but want to change their lives. And so this one day, we take them into the drug rehabilitation center, and I meet Jordan. We're helping doing a work project, and, and I said to Jordan, tell me, uh, you know, how are things with you? Now, you know, the guy's on a drug rehabilitation program, and he says, oh, you know, I, I'm okay, I suppose. And, I, and I, I said, you know, God has a plan and a purpose for your life, Jordan. And, and if you will commit yourself to Jesus Christ, he will do things with your life that you never thought possible. And he says, yeah, man, thanks, thanks for that. You know, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. You know it's, it is very biblically based, this drug rehabilitation program. And, and so he, he'd been here in this. And, uh, and I said, do you mind if I pray for you? He said, yeah, sure, sure, I'll pray for me. So I, I just laid my hands on his stomach, and I, I said, Lord, whatever your plan and your purpose is for Jordan's life, I just call it into being now in Jesus' name. We rebuke the enemy's plan to kill, seal, and destroy in his life, and we release his p kingdom purpose to be fulfilled in Jesus' name. You know, we, we were there for two or three days, and then we left there, and... and um, it was six months later that we went to Christ for the Nations Bible School, and uh, we were talking to a team that were going to come again with us to Jacksonville. So I thought, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a little bit of a story about people in this, in this drug rehabilitation program. They, they say, do you know Jordan? I said, yes. He said, he's a student now at Christ for the Nations, and we met him that day. He was a him and his friend Mantrell were students at Christ. He was so inspired by what had gone on. He said, I want to go where those, those students came from because I want to see my life changed. So we took him for dinner, for lunch that day, and I said, Jordan, tell me your story. Jordan said, uh, I've been on 10 drug rehabilitation programs in my lifetime, and everyone has failed. He said, I've died three times in ER. And he said, they've resuscitated me from drug overdose. I've taken all the drugs of people who had died around me to try an overdose. And for some reason, I couldn't die. And he said, I was going through this drug rehabilitation program, and you prayed for me, and something shifted on the inside of me. He said, I lost any desire for any addiction. All I could think about is going to this Bible school. And, and he left there, fast-tracked through the program, went to Christ for the Nations Bible School. When we were there the next day, uh, somebody was talking to me about what we're doing, and I said, oh, I just had the most exciting testimony of a young man who was on a drug rehabilitation program, and now he's at Christ for the Nations Bible School. He says, oh, do you mean Jordan? I said, yes. He said, look, he's just come on outreach with me to Mardi Gras in New Orleans. He said, let me send you this photograph. And he, he gave me this photograph off his phone. And he said, this is Jordan uh, witnessing to a drug addict on the streets in Mardi Gras in New Orleans. He said, I thought he was going to kill him. He said, he was so intense about saying, man, you need to give your life to Jesus because I was where you were a year ago. But Jesus has come in and changed my life. We've been following Jordan and helping him over the last year or two. And somebody sent us this photo of Jordan speaking to the student body at Christ for the Nations in front of 600 people, telling them what Jesus had done for his life. You know, it's a great testimony and a great story. And praise God, it's what we live for. It's what we invest our lives in. But remember, when I first met Jordan, he had a kingdom purpose even though other people saw him as a drug addict, even though some people thought him, they'd written him off thinking the most he can do is get clean. But I saw more in him than that because God saw more in him than that too. I want to encourage you today, don't write people off. God has a plan and a purpose for the, you know, the down and out. So, uh, but not only the down and out, but he's got one for the managing director of your company. He's got one for the, for the person on the checkout at the grocery store. He's got per, pe that in, in your family reunion. You, know, you may be God's secret weapon in that family reunion. You may be the only Christian going in your social circle to an event. But say, God, use me to bring freedom to these people. The God that created you has a purpose 
for you. I just hope I'm inspiring you in that tonight. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, my favorite scripture, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The God of the universe not only knows about me, but he has a specific plan for my life and for your life too. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One of the things that, that we are learning, and we're still learning, we're, we're much further on than we used to be, but is being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of these purpose things that, that gurus are doing, uh, they, they're using business principles and they're doing a good job, but they miss the leading and anointing of the Holy Spirit. With the leading and anointing of the Holy Spirit, it opens up a whole new dynamic of what God can do to change a situation and a circumstance. For, for, uh, for me and Julie, we, we tried to, to trust God on a daily basis. Um, we, we were coming to, to uh, Minnesota, and, and the plan was we were coming to Wisconsin for a Tuesday night service, a prophetic evening. That's the only thing we had scheduled. And then a friend of ours said, I'm getting married in Shell Lake, and it's about that same time. Would you come to the wedding? And so our trip started to build, and then we said to Pastor Kurt, could we serve you at any time? Well, these are the dates we have available. And then he said, yes, come. And so this started to build uh, of this leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I probably got, I don't know, 500 pastors' email addresses. I could have emailed 500 people, but I felt led to, to email Pastor Kurt and say, look, you know, and he said, well, if you can't fill the time, you know, maybe we could do something. I'm like, look, I, I'm not trying to fill the time. I'm asking you, can we serve you? If not, I'll see that as a closed door from the Lord, uh, but I'm knocking the door. And he said, okay, come, we'll, we'll come and do something. And we've been trying to get, uh, get uh, in touch with and meet with a, a, a missionary organization in Texas for the last two years and just haven't got there. And this week, when I posted a photograph on Facebook of us with, with the church here and saying, you know, we're having a good time in Burnsville, Minnesota, this missionary down in Texas, mess, put it on the wall. You can see it for yourself on the wall. He said, oh, I'm coming to Minnesota this week. I, I'm coming to Elk River. And I said, oh, well, we're leaving Minnesota and we're actually going to Wisconsin. But I said, we're going back to Sisseton, uh, South Dakota next week. I said, let me look where Elk River is. It's right on the route that we're going. I said, we'll be there Monday. He said, yeah, we'll be there Monday. So we're going to meet up uh, and see him there. You know, God has a plan and a purpose. For somebody to drive all the way from Texas, I know we drove from Florida, but he drove from Texas for a divine appointment. You know, God wants to, you to meet people. He wants to orchestrate your schedule and your day if you can trust him. I could tell you story after story about that. God will give you you know, God wants you to see yourself as he sees you. You know, this is so, so important. If you remember nothing tonight, I want you to realize that God sees you differently to the way you see yourself. God doesn't see you through the filter that you see yourself. You know, how many of you, as you're getting older, you look in the mirror, you're like, oh my goodness, who is that person in there? Before I get a chance to put all my makeup on and things, you know, I, I don't wear makeup just in case you're watching on live stream and... Um, but you know what I'm saying, you know, we're getting older and we think, oh, we change. But, you know, God sees you differently. He sees you as his child. He sees you, I believe, as his secret weapon. He says, if you could see yourself like I see you and put yourself in a position where I can use you, I'll change the world through your life. I'll change your family's world through your life. I'll change Burnsville through your life. I'll change Minnesota, even the USA, or maybe another nation through your life. God wants all of us to be involved in what he is doing in this earth. He has a global plan, and he wants to use your life. Let's, let's confirm this from Scripture before I hand over to Julie. In 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, it says this, it said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, 
all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this is the line I want you to take home with you tonight. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It goes on to verse 19. It says, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors. We've heard this word so many times. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. Wherever you go, you represent heaven. I I, I know most of us, when we go, we think we represent ourselves, but we also represent heaven. We represent heaven well, or we represent heaven badly. Sometimes I think we can get in a a routine of thinking, I don't want to say too much about my Christian life, just in case people ask me questions and I make a mess of the answers, and I'll be embarrassed. What if they think I'm stupid? What if they think I'm crazy or a kooky? And, you know, people think like that. You need to get over that and realize we we represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in what we're doing. So it's important to understand what happens when we get saved. Verse 17 of that chapter says, we are made a new creation in Christ. We're not what we were. Julie said this on Sunday. We're not what we were and we're not what we're going to be. We're on a journey, but we're not that old person anymore. We've given our lives to Jesus Christ. There's been a transfer from death to life. Verse 18 says, we are given the ministry of reconciliation. God places every new believer in the ministry. If I said to you before the start of the service, how many of you are in ministry? Probably half of you are like, no, not me. That's the pastor's job. Or I'm not in ministry. I, I, I didn't write this. God wrote this. He gives you the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling a lost and a dying world back to Jesus, to God himself. Verse 19 says, God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The word committed there means to entrust something. In the same way that someone was faithful to bring that word of reconciliation to your life, it's like a relay race. Now you're holding the baton. Now you're it. You have to run your race and you have to pass it on to someone else in your place. Then we read in verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. I know Pastor Kurt has done a great job of talking about being ambassadors for Christ. The power that is available to us when we are in Christ. All authority is delegated to us. You know, I could tell you story after story, very funny stories where people have said no to us in authority in the government, and and I feel God whisper, don't worry, they think they have authority. They don't realize you're on a kingdom assignment. Just be patient and gracious. And my flesh wants to tell them, who do you think you are? Stopping us doing this. You know, we're doing a good thing, but I don't. I says, okay, is there any way we can do this? And the next minute, we see a change because kingdom authority has overruled earthly authority. Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, we read the story of the young lawyer who asks Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus, by his answer, he refused to give one commandment. So this lawyer is trying to trick Jesus, really. He said, what's the most important commandment? He says, I'm not going to give you just one. He replied to the lawyer, saying, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And quickly, he says, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. I want to leave you with this diagram before Julie comes up and share, which is God's framework for a Christian life as I see this. On the vertical axis there, you see man to God, and you see that our identity is found in the great commandment. We are to love God with all our heart, the first commandment. And then our purpose is found on the horizontal axis there. Our purpose is the great commission, that we are to love others as we love ourselves. Our first relationship with God gives us identity. 
a second relationship with humanity reveals our purpose. The first one is the great commandment. We spoke about this uh, on Sunday morning. I know this is a great commandment preaching church, that you know that our role is to go into the, all the world. Now, but don't get hung up on the, the, the fact that God's going to send you on a plane to another country. I always like to say, go into every man's world, everybody's world. You can go into somebody's world tomorrow in your sphere of influence, in your workplace, in your family, that I will never go into. Go into that and make disciples of them. The second relationship is the great, uh, sorry, that was the great commandment. The second one is the great commission, which is that that you go into all the world. As followers of Christ, we are called to have a great commandment, great commission focused life. Every day, ask yourself, how today can my, can my relationship with God grow? And God, what is the assignment that you have on my life. Julie's going to come and share uh, some practical tips on this. Do you need a stretch break? You're all very quiet. Maybe the cogs are turning, the wheels are turning, and you're just absorbing. But do you know, life is so much better when it's lived on purpose. We can bumble along going from day to day without a sense of purpose just existing, or we can dig in, seek God, and find that sweet spot. Have you ever been somewhere and done something, and you suddenly think, I was made for this? I remember when I started doing the women's conferences when we were pastoring in England, and I had that aha moment one time. I'm just leading, I'm facilitating the service. And as I look out at this crowd of women, I just get this download of, yes, I was made for this. This is my sweet spot. This is what God has made me for. And we all need to experience that. And we all want to make our lives count for something. You know, on the headstone, the gravestone, you have the date of birth, or maybe just the year and the month, and then you have the date of, of the death. You know, the dash in between is what our lives will count for. What will your life count for between the date of your birth and the date that you go to be with Jesus? That was a big question, I know. But you were created for more than just existing. Have you ever said to yourself, like we did, there's got to be more than this? Have you ha ever had that time when you're just questioning, was this what I was made for, or is this something more? And I think that question comes to us at different times in our lives, and especially when there's that dissatisfaction that starts to grow, and you're like, mm, maybe not feeling as content as I thought I was, and that's an indication uh, that God is moving us on. The combination of your gifts and your character makes you unique. Our fingerprints, no one in this world ever will have the same fingerprint as you. It sounds simple, doesn't it? We take it for granted. The police use it all the time to identify. No one has the same fingerprint. And so you're made for a specific purpose. Yes, we've looked at the broad purpose that we're all meant to be ambassadors for Christ. But within that, there is a specific purpose that you are hardwired and designed for within the kingdom. Have you noticed, though, how sometimes it's really hard to focus? We live in this world where everything is fast-moving, technology is advancing, it's certainly leaving me behind, which is why I take my techie everywhere with me. <laughs> but, you know, distraction has become the main attraction in our society. And so it's hard to focus on one thing. Everything around us seems to be vying for our attention. Have you noticed that? And just the speed, even if I can share the um, commercials, the advertisements on TV here, they move so much quicker than our commercials in the UK. You know, you go from one topic to the other, to the other, to the other, and they barely finish their sentence and you're into the next ad. It's not like that in the UK, and that creates frantic motion, which distracts us from being focused. 
1 Timothy 6, verse 6 said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. In our fast-moving society and in our culture, we lose that sense of godliness with contentment, being content where we are, finding time to be with the Lord, to dig in, to focus on, okay, God, what is it? What is it that you've made me for? What am I missing? We need to take the time to do that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The New Living Translation version says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. You know, society is chasing wealth. Like we were. Big house, fast car, nice vacations, wealth. And yet, Scripture says that godliness with contentment is great wealth. And that, we can be so much richer when we're working according to our purpose, the way God has designed us and molded us, than anything that we can strive for. We are living a much more rich in purpose, lifestyle, being who God has called us to be now than we were then. Yes, we had the trappings, the world's trappings, but that wasn't true rich riches. And that wasn't true purpose. That wasn't our true purpose. It fed into where we are today, but it wasn't where we were to stay. We were in business and we were good at it, but it was for a selfish purpose. It was to make us comfortable, to make us not to have to worry about the future because we had it all sewn out up because we were earning enough and we could do a retirement plan and we could take care of everything but it was all about us we were chasing comfort and not conviction so if you have a pen and paper I want you to write down a question what am I chasing comfort or conviction I'm going to look at four starting points to consider to set you off on this journey of discovering your kingdom purpose. And there are four looks. Look back, look in, look up, and look forward. So let's take a look at look back. Look back. We need to look back and examine where we've come from. Search for clues about where our purpose first showed up. Now, what I mean by that is for me personally, as a young child, I was always caring for someone else. I was babysitting at the age of 10. I just loved to look after, to care, to nurture. There were several of my friends going through hard times in their family situation. And I would, I would come alongside and I would nurture them. I would want to make things better. Um, another thing about me, as I looked back... as is that though my parents, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Though my parents took me to church as a small child and I was dedicated in a Baptist church as a baby, when they moved, because they moved several times when I was young, they didn't find a church to go to. Once we moved from that one church they went to, they just didn't. But I did. There was always a Sunday school. Mom, Dad, will you take me this Sunday school? Can I go here? And they would always take me. They never stood in the way. And they would come and support me at the Sunday school anniversary. I might sing or be in a play or something. There was never any opposition. But I always found a church to go to. Just as a little girl, just going on my own, it didn't matter. And so as I look back, keys, two big clues really to my kingdom purpose are my love for God and my love for his people. And as you look back into the things that you enjoy doing, as a child, the types of toys that you played with. Did you like building things? Did you like the crosswords and mental things? They're all clues to how you're wired. And that's why being practical is is a gift. We're not all called to do the same thing. You know, to build this building, you need an architect. You need a surveyor. You need somebody who's going to work the money, the books, make sure they'll do the budget and it all works out. Then you need the, the lay the foundation, a concrete guy. Then you need the one that does the bricks to make sure they all line up. You know, we're all called to a specific purpose. And, it's, and God uses what he's already placed inside of us. It's for us to dig out, to mine. Okay, God, 
What is it about what I enjoyed when I was growing up? What, what were the things that I chose to do when I had a choice? But also, what were the things that you, you didn't choose to do? And that's okay. It's okay. We're not called to do the same thing. I remember someone saying, oh, I think, I think you should be a nurse. I'm like, I hate blood. <laughs> I'm really not good. <laughs> I, could, I could nurse your spiritual health. Give me that. But, you know, don't put me in that scenario. You would not like me and I would not be very helpful at all. <laughs> My father always wanted me to be an accountant. He thought that would be a good career for me. Um, no, maths was never my strength. <laughs> but English and people and patience, counseling, that's me. So they were two big clues, loving God and loving his people. So I encourage you, ask questions about the past that will help you to identify what God has put inside of you. It's not about striving to do something else. It's about finding out who you are. But keep in mind, even if bad stuff happened in the past, take some time to consider that helping other people to overcome those things that you've now come through might be part of your call, but it might not be your full call. I'll explain that. So like Jordan, he came through drug rehabilitation problems with drugs, alcohol, sex, all those things that he struggled with. He might think, right, great, I'm going to go back to City Rescue Mission and I'm going to help pull other people out from where I was. And that's very honorable and very commendable, but that might not be his purpose. That might be part of his purpose, that he can come alongside people. But what if he had a teaching gift we saw him on the platform there, and he wasn't just giving his testimony to the student body. He was giving them a message from God. That is his purpose. Yes, he can come alongside people that struggled like he struggled because he has an empathy. But what if you have a teaching gift and you can teach and train and direct people to not get into that position that you've come through, that you can help prevent rather than be a cure after the event. So as you're looking at, the, at your resources and your identity and the things that you're good at and the things that you've come through as you look back, don't get stuck with, okay, I'm a really good mom. Let's just come alongside moms because there may be a bigger purpose encompassed there. So your subject, for his subject, might not be addiction, but rather teaching people to value themselves and to build self-esteem so that they don't fall into that lifestyle. When we were at Bible school, a visiting speaker gave us a prophetic word that God was going to pour out our former anointing. Um, as we said, we were good in the business world. We were good at what we did. And we didn't really know how that was going to translate into ministry. Because you get this business ministry education, this compartmentalized thinking mindset that, that, there's, that they don't touch, that, that the skills are not transferable from the business world to the kingdom, but they are. And if God has trained you in the business world, then he wants to lend your strength to his kingdom using those talents that he's already given you. There's no such thing as a natural talent. I used to think there's a natural gift a natural talent, and then there's a spiritual talent. No, <laughs> they're all God-given. He knitted us together in our mother's womb. So there's no such thing as a natural or a supernatural talent because it all comes from God anyway. So, question, another question for you. What do I remember spending my time doing that I enjoyed or that I hated? When you really loathe something, it leads you to what you do enjoy doing. So don't be afraid to, to, to say, oh, oh, I really hated doing that. That really wasn't me. Because that frees you. That frees you from that. When we were at school, they would say, work on your weaknesses. But now life coaches say, work on your strengths. Don't waste time working on your weaknesses. Because if that's not how you're made, then you're just wasting your time. Work on your strengths. Work on what God has given you second thing we're going to do is we're going to look in. Once you've taken the time to look back, 
you can start to look in and focus on living life in the present. You know, so often it's hard to live life in the now. People are chasing tomorrow, letting our past mistakes hinder us from enjoying the present. And being caught up in the doing and being driven. We live in a drivenness kind of age, if you like, where everything is so fast moving. It's, it's difficult to spend that opportunity, take that opportunity to be present. Sometimes I can be talking to someone and I know they're not listening to me. They're not engaged with me. They're thinking about lunch. They're thinking about who walked past when I'm talking to them. And they find it hard to engage in the present. And it's really difficult. But what, what we use our time for in the now and in the present sets us up for the future, for what God is going to use us. So time is one of those things that we don't get back. And I think, you know, hitting 50 and then going through the cancer and um, we're like, it just makes me value time that much more. We, we only have a length of days, a span of life to impact in the kingdom. When we get to heaven, there'll be no opportunity and no need to reach out to the world around us. We'll all be saved, we'll be there, those that are there. You know, we can only impact the kingdom and extend the kingdom while we're here on earth. So we need to be effective in what we're doing. What and who we focus our time on sets us up for success in the future. I just want to make every second count since we had that cancer diagnosis in 2016. It was a, it was a wake-up call. Firstly, we came to the conclusion that having to go through the chemotherapy and the radiation treatment just felt like a waste of our time. Hospital visits, driving back and forth 90 minutes each way to the hospital, needing to rest in between. What a waste of time. That's what it felt like. I know that you would say, yes, but the treatment plus the prayer plus the Lord's healing my body, you know, brought me through that. And there is purpose in that. Don't get me wrong. Hear what I'm saying here. But there's so much work to be done for the kingdom. We don't have time to be sick. We don't have time to be sick. You know, we are needed. There's people that are waiting on us. And there's people waiting on you to find your kingdom purpose, to get free, to know the God that you serve is for you and not against you, and to step out in faith and reach them. Do you know, it made us so much more aware of time going through that. And being present is often just one-on-one. -on -one. Giving someone time is often what people need. They don't need a sermon. They don't need expertise. They just need someone to listen to them. Just to say, I see you. Just like the guy I shared on Sunday. You saw me, he said to that young girl. You saw me. And we all need to be seen. We all need to be seen. They need a listening ear and they need to feel heard. So quality time is one of the five love languages and it's a way of giving and receiving love. So more questions for you about time this time. How do I perceive time? What is my focus? We're honing things down a little bit now. And it's going to take a little bit of work. But it'll be worth it. How can I reprioritize? We get the same 24 hours in a day. Every single one of us. Not one gets a minute more than the other. How can we be prioritizing our time to be more effective? The third look is look up. Living in the present gets you ready to look up and to plan the future. There's nothing better than having something to look forward to. As a child, we would just have one vacation a year, maybe just a week Maybe drive, just drive two hours away in the UK. They don't drive very far for vacation. Um, but it would be something that you would look forward to. And even if you're having a tough time at school or something, or it, at, we, with your siblings, you're like, oh, but it's okay, because we're going on holiday soon. That was the respite. And that's what it's meant to be. Recreation is recreation. 
recreation is, you know, we're meant to re be recreated <laughs> when we take that time out. So we all need something to look forward to. But first we need to look to God, look up to God. When our eyes are focused on him and his plans, and we seek him first, like Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. We spend so much of our time focused on other stuff. When we stay focused on him and listening to the Spirit's leading, which is why we need to know him. We need to know and be able to hear his voice and recognize it because there are so many voices around us. We need to know, is this you, Lord? Will you confirm it for me? And when you ask for confirmation, that's not doubt. That's not unbelief. It's just, Lord, I need some confirmation. And he always gives it if you're unsure. Go to, look to God first to give you fresh vision for your life. And then allow him. This is the key. You've got to allow him to order your steps. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He doesn't force anything on us. He'll knock at the door. He'll say, you're ready to do this. But we're the ones that have to step out in faith. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. We've been on a journey of learning what it means to allow God to direct and sometimes redirect our steps. We might think this is a really good idea, and it could be a good idea, but now because of the time factor, we don't want to waste time. We don't want to do good ideas. We don't want to do good things. We want to do the God thing. We're like, Lord, will you confirm this? And, and if it's not you, then we don't want to do it. We don't want to go where he doesn't want us to go. The first year when we were traveling in 2016 and raising our funds, it just felt like we were just aimless, to be honest. We were just going here and there. We were having pressure from our missions agency. You've got to get your budget. Go share with so many people. I said to Mark, this is sales training. I've had 20 years in sales. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not a hard closer anyway, so it's not going to work that way. So we just had to take stock and say, Lord, we want to do this your way. Lead us to people that we can minister to. There was a mindset shift. Instead of chasing the budget, we were, Lord, let us be a blessing. If we're going to stay with these people, let us minister to their heart. What do they need from you? Give us a word of encouragement for, for them. And so the shift was... Lord, how can we represent you? How can we minister? And then the finances followed. You know, even with the training we had from a missions organization, it, it was out of whack. Seek God first. Look to him first and let him order your steps. First Samuel 2 verse 9 says, He guards the steps of his faithful ones, but the wicked perish in darkness. For by his own strength shall no man prevail. We need to look up to God, which is where our help and our strength comes from. Apart from God, we can do nothing of any lasting, eternal value. Yes, we can do good things, but without him, nothing of any lasting, eternal value. We need to seek him first and seek him only. So questions for you if you're writing them down. Where am I looking? Am I looking to God or trusting in my own efforts? What is my vision for the future? And focus here is key. We're talking about this. Sometimes it's difficult to focus, but focusing in on these questions and being honest and transparent between you and the Lord. Where am I? Where really is my focus? Do I have a vision for the future? And if you don't, ask him, because he does. He sees the end from the beginning. He has a plan. We just need to get ourselves in line with his plan. Focus is key. If we can see it, we can believe it, and we can receive it. Sounds like a cliche, but unpack that for yourselves. If you can see it in your mind's eye, and if you can believe God is in it, and you can trust him, then you can receive it. The fourth look is to look forward. We must look forward by first crafting some clear statements of intent and to write them down. Habakkuk 2 verse 2 says, Then the Lord answered me and said, 
write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. And we were given that prophetic word and when we were students back in 2003. And from time to time, we would revisit it because we transcribed it. And we would look again at it and say, okay, Lord, what does this mean? And is something we're doing out of alignment with what you want to do with us to make this prophetic word come to pass? You know, we had to position ourselves differently. And that meant a mental shift it meant a relocation for us. It doesn't always mean that for you. But it meant a relocation. It meant a, are you willing to leave everything behind kind of thing for us? Because Mark is a 10-year planner. And believe me, he would have had planned God out of it. He's done that many times, and he'll tell you that. But to leave everything behind meant that we had to fully rely on God. When we were in Zimbabwe... We had like rulers and stationary and equipment, and they had a little frog on it. And it said, the frog was F-R-O-G, as you spell frog, fully rely on God. And I remember saying to Mark, we don't do that in the West. We fully rely on us. Especially if you're raised in the back road like I was, if you don't work, you don't eat. We had a great work ethic hard working. I had two jobs, two part-time jobs at 13, and I still did well in school, but it was still me. It was still me. So when we were given that prophetic word, we knew that there had to be some changes, but we didn't harp on about it. We didn't look at it, pray into it. Some people say, you've got to pray into it every day. No, from time to time, we're like, how are we doing, Lord? Are we moving towards what you've put it in, in over us, or spoken over us, or are we moving away from it? And sometimes having that time of evaluating. So writing something down will give you that benchmark that you can come back to and actually measure, am I making progress in this? Are the choices I'm making moving me towards this vision? Or actually, are they moving me away? So it can become a plumb line for us. We didn't know how we were going to get there. But we just had to listen to that still small voice every step along the way. Writing down the vision helps to create the alignment for the assignment and tie up the past, the present, and the future. So these clear statements, it doesn't have to be an essay, but I, I would like to see, or God is showing me this, this, and this, so I'm going to realign. It's, if I want to lose weight, I have to make some good decisions. I have to make some choices along the way. You know, there's no fast track. Take a pill, lose weight. It doesn't work. Because the basis is, if you take more calories in than you burn off, you're going to put on weight. <laughs> Come on. So I'm trying. Please pray for me. I'm trying to make some good choices. You know, we were at the restaurant earlier, and I, I love sweet potato fries. But I'm not going to have them. Because... I want to lose weight. I have to do this. And I, in order to do that, I have to make some choices. But I also said, Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, help me. And he will, and he does too. So we need to live intentionally. We need to have a clear vision of where we're going and what we're, what we're about, what, how, how we're wired, what God is going to use us for. And you don't need a complete thing because it unfolds. It evolves just in the same way that our relationship with God evolves. We learn to trust him more the more we know who he is and how he operates. Then the same is true. But write down what he gives you and the things that you know about yourself. Just bring those to the forefront and then say, and particularly if you're married, write a vision for your marriage. I was just looking at Zach there. I mean, gosh, if we'd written a vision for our marriage when we were newly married like them, you know, it just keeps you on track. It keeps you on track. So living intentionally, fully surrendered to God's will, attracts God's provision and turns your story into a life of purpose, passion, and power. There's that significance. Our lives are meant to be significant. And our significance is found in him and what he's called us to do. Our security is found in knowing who we are in Christ. Our acceptance is knowing that he is our father no matter what. And he, he can only do good. 
And he knows how to give his children good gifts. So I don't know about you, but I want my life to be full of purpose, passion, and power. So remember, look back, look in, look up, but look forward. And live out the abundant life that Jesus died. He paid the ultimate price for each and every one of us to have. It's been a joy being with you these few days. And it's nice to come back again the Sunday evening and then today and recognize a few faces. So we feel like we're getting to know you a little bit. But we're available to you as you unpack this. And I encourage you, do something with this today. It sounds like simple steps, but it'll take you a little while. But it will put you on that path of uh, actually honing in on what it is God has designed you for to bring glory to him in the earth. Don't forget to pick up our newsletter. Sign up for our email. Uh, our email there is available to you. If we can help you in any way, we're available. People say, oh, but you're always busy. Yeah, but we're on the road for hours at, at a time. We can pick the phone up. We can send you an email or a text if you have a prayer request or if you're saying, I'm stuck on this. You know, What do you think about that? We're available. We're available to you. So thank you, Pastor Kurt and Julie, for entrusting this time with us, and I hope that there's something, there's some nugget that you can take away to work on that will just fine tune your relationship with God first, and then how that outworks in your purpose to the world around you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Mark and Julie. As as we found out, they're they're so practical things. But as you work on this and implement them, they really produce life change. And talking about living life for the Lord is, is living life with intention. And uh, as fast as, as things go by, it's horrible to get at any stage and point in life. And it happens when you're young, you're middle-aged, you're older to say, I thought I would do more. I, I, I think I can do more. And as that saying goes, we, we always underestimate we always overestimate what we can do in a short term. But we always underestimate what we can do in a longer term. But you have to start to, 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 to have any length of period of time. And so it's starting with some of these simple things, these practical things. Uh, but I, I appreciate that because um, God is, w w knowing God and how he created us on purpose, for purpose. He's intentional with everything that he did. And so uh, we thank you for the encouragement and uh, all, of that, all of that insight. Amen. Praise God.